good evening, everybody. If I could get your attention. I don't know if I can get control of this crowd or not, but i uh, I will be using this mic. I'm kind of soft voice. If you can't hear me, wave at me, and I'll try to do something about it. Uh, I've got a few words about what's going to go on tonight and how we're going to proceed. Uh, I would emphasize that this is an information only meeting. Uh, the proposition that we're going to talk to about will be voted on in the annual meeting on the 22nd. So what we're doing tonight is for informational purposes only. Uh, this is a, we're going to be discussing, of course, a proposal for renovation of the bunker, all the bunkers on the golf course. Uh, the proposition, the proposal has been approved by the Greens Committee, the Golf Committee, the Finance Committee, and unanimously recommended by the Board of Directors. Uh, uh, this is a proposal to upgrade our bunkers throughout. The bunkers we have, of course, are 54 years old. They were built with the techniques that were prominent 54 years ago. There is no, absolutely no drainage underneath them. The terrain around the bunkers is not sculpted properly, as we will discuss later on. So this is an investment to upgrade the club, to upgrade this old golf course and bring some more wow, wow factor back to the club, as we will discuss later on. Uh, in addition, just as a matter of information, what we have is a proposal about the bunkers, and the bunkers only, and the, and the, the terrain around the bunkers. We have also, the board has also contracted with uh, Mr. Bergen to develop a similar plan for the tees. Now that will be a plan that will be uh, on file and will be there whenever it will be done and ready so we'll know what to do whenever the board and the clubs decides to move forward on the tees. But that is not for your that is not for discussion tonight, it's just for your information. Um, the way the thing is going to go tonight is that Mr. Bergen is going to make a presentation about his firm and how he does business and about the plan for the bunkers that he is developing for us. Uh, after he makes his presentation, we will have some comments from uh, Mike Carlton from the Greens Committee, Jeff Yarber from the Golf Committee, and Bob Reed from the Finance Committee. So at that time, you will have you know, information. And after those comments, we will open the floor for questions, discussions, questions of Mr. Bergen, questions of any of the board, any questions or discussions you might want and then we'll have dinner. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Bill Bergen uh, has been interviewed by the board and everything. Uh, we've selected Mr. Bergen because uh, of his background and experience. Uh, he was a golf professional in the 80s. <laughs> After he came off the tour, he taught uh, at a golf course for eight hours a day for a couple of years. And he's, he said something revealing to me that in that, while he was teaching those amateurs, he got a different understanding of the game, which has affected his architectural work because he understands the needs of the professionals and the, un un the needs of the amateurs. Uh, he's been an architect, a golf architect since 1990. Uh, one of the reasons we selected him is that he has 
experience doing mountain courses, and he has done extensive work on several George Cobb courses. So he comes to us with some background. So with that, Mr. Burton. Thanks, Alan. Can you guys hear me? Is this all working? Okay, great. So um, appreciate you being here. Uh, great turnout, and also a nice energy level in the room. When you when you hear a, you're about to speak or listening to a group gathering, you can always sort of sense. But I, I sensed a nice, uh, fun, and enthusiastic energy. So um, with that, we'll kind of explain things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my company, and I'm going to talk a little bit about process, and then we'll talk about your golf course a little bit as well. So we always ask this question. We sort of have a a process that we use on each job, whether it's a really big job or a smaller job. We always ask, why renovate? Because honestly, to inconvenience members, to change the golf course, to do work to something that's like your family is sometimes uncomfortable. So we want to give you good, compelling reasons about why we're going to do what we're going to do to your, to your property. We do it the same way. Now, the projects all turn out differently, but we start mechanically. So what does that mean? Well, here we're talking about a bunker renovation. And bunker maintenance is one of those things that can't be any more frustrating for a maintenance staff. You can have the golf course looking so well on a Friday morning. And Friday afternoon, a big storm comes. And Saturday morning, you are out. they're out there you know, shoveling sand, trying to get it in shape for you guys. It's just one of those things that's truly demoralizing. So having your bunkers in good shape is a big deal. There's a lot more that goes into the mechanics that we're looking at, but drainage and the way bunkers function, we're always going to deal with that. And actually, even though we're talking bunkers with your golf course, we're going to look at the area around the bunkers as well, and drainage will be, would be part of that. So th those things you know, we start mechanically. We want, to, we want to give Nathan and his crew the best opportunity to provide a consistent, high-quality product for you, okay? So we've identified that you guys want to do a bunker renovation. Well, going in and fixing them gives us what I call a strategic opportunity. In other words, we don't have to put them back exactly as they are. We need to adjust them mechanically so they don't, they don't wash anymore, so water doesn't come in, so they drain well. But we can also look at positioning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because we may put some back exactly in their same location. We may adjust some others. So you do have strategic opportunities about the way the golf course plays. So that picture is kind of interesting. So here's a hole that has nothing but forced carry in order to play it. Same hole. It used to be a par four. This was a Donald Ross golf course. So back in Ross's day, this was a par four. In, in a previous renovation after Ross, they made it a par three. We took it back. But the point of this is, you notice the pond was shaped differently. And you notice there's ground available for people to play golf. Well, Alan mentioned that my teaching background influences the way I look at a golf course. And so I'll go a little bit further into that. So I was fortunate. I, I played 50 PGA Tour events, but I only made 17 cuts. So that doesn't get you very far in where you want to go. But I, I was able to play. I played three U.S. Opens, and I played two British Opens, and got to see what real golf was like. But then I went and taught at Cherokee in Atlanta, which is a 2,000-member club. For three years, I gave as many lessons as I could give. And then I went to work for Bob Cup. Well, as a teacher, I learned what you know 99% of the people who play golf deal with when they play golf. As a pro, you're not interested in, in the 99%. You really aren't. You're interested in, in shooting low scores and, and, and doing well and making some money. But as a teacher, that influences my design philosophy even more than anything else in my career. And we've had a similar thing happen on all the courses I work on. The course ratings will go up. okay, And at the same time, the slope rating will go down. And I know some of you don't know what that means, so I'll explain. A course rating is based on a zero handicap playing from those tees. Hence, you see the course rating drop as the tees move forward because a, a, a zero handicap should shoot lower as the golf course gets shorter. A slope rating is based on a 15 handicapper. Okay, Completely different criteria. 
So if your course is bragging that you have a high slope rating, you really don't want to go play that golf course because that marketing person doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, that's not a good indication. And hopefully you guys now will look at scorecards and you go, okay, Bill said there's a relationship there, which there is. And if you have a, you know, a 75 course rating, your slope is going to be higher. But there is a relationship there, and it's based on the ability for average golfers to be able to navigate their way around the course. So everything we do with tee positioning, bunker positioning, green surrounds has to do with that. And we'll take that same philosophy here on a bunker renovation. So we will think about the way you play the golf course and, and how it treats you and, and how you play the game on the ground. Because truthfully, we all play the game on the ground a lot more than you would think. Even, even if you look at hitting greens in regulation, the best golfers in the world hit 12 to 14 greens in regulation, which means they're chipping four to six times around the course, and if you add par fives into that, it's even more. Well, if you take the average player, typical golfer, we're doing that way more than that. So what happens around the greens is a big deal, and this bunker renovation will deal with a little bit more than just bunkers. It, it will address what happens around the greens. So that's a bit of the strategic aspect. The last thing we look at are the aesthetics. There's almost nothing better than beautiful blue sky, green grass, and white sand, well-maintained white sand, okay? So that adds an element to your golf course. You have a beautiful property here. You guys all know it. But to add bunkers that are consistent, they look good all the time, is really going to put that wow factor that Alan mentioned back in your golf course. And I think the number one aesthetic influence on a golf course is conditioning, okay? Quality grass, good greens, nice bunkers, it's beautiful. So we will be concentrating on that. So these are just, just pictures of some of our work. <clears throat> okay, so how do you go about a project? Um, oftentimes we do a master plan. We're not doing that in this situation, although we've talked a, lo a little bit about it. And you also, there's two, you know, two things that happen. A master plan helps you get a project approved. Construction drawings are actually what you build by. So um, a master plan literally starts this way. It goes hole by hole. Each of those little bullet points out to the right, you're not expected to be able to read those, but those are action items. And the text explains what you're going to do and why we're going to do it. Well, here, we'll end up doing that for you guys more just in the bunker process. So we'll, we will go about that process. But when you're building a golf course, you want good quality plans so you can get a contractor for an excellent price and you know ex exactly what you're going to deal with through the process. So grading plans are the, the number one aspect of any construction job. And so we, we'll do grading plans. In fact, my assistant was out today flying your golf course with a drone. I don't know if anybody saw that out there. But we actually do topography maps with our drone technology. It's fantastic. So, you know, to come to a place like this, it's oftentimes you go, well, how am I going to deal with topography? I don't, I don't know what's what, but we're able to actually do that. Um, and so that, he, was, he flew all day today. Um, so that will help us develop our grading plans. And then our company, we go well beyond the grading plan aspect of design in what we call our takeoff plans. This is a cut and fill plan. You'll notice the chart that's, that's over, over right here. Um, it, it lists the cut and fill. As we get closer, each area, whether we're moving six yards of dirt or 6,000 yards of dirt, is documented. Okay? It's listed for the contractor. They know the areas where they can borrow dirt. They know the areas that they need dirt. All of that is part of having a successful project. If we're hauling dirt all over your property, we're damaging cart path, we're damaging grass, we want to minimize that as best we can. A proper grading plan, a good cut and fill plan allows us to do that. So even on smaller jobs, we do that. We'll still have a cut and fill chart like this. It, the quantities won't be as big, but we'll still have that. We'll know which holes we need dirt on, we know where we're going to get it, and we'll know which holes need it. Same thing with drainage. Okay? We will be doing a little bit of drainage work. Um, all the pipes will be laid out. The sizes will be there for the contractor. The lengths will be there for the contractor. Everything that we talk about in this project will be on paper, okay? And a chart that goes with it. Irrigation the same way on the bunker job. If we can hit zero irrigation, um, that would be preferable, but we do have an allowance in our budget for irrigation. So 
Uh, we will try not to, to disturb the irrigation on this project, but again, we will be analyzing all of its positioning before, during the design phase, and we'll know if we're, gonna, if we're gonna run into any situation like that. And lastly, we get into grassing. Again, you'll see the chart up on the upper left. As you get closer, each area will be marked with a quantity and type of grass. So again, contractor knows exactly what's what. Now, my role um, is not only just doing the design work, it's actually supervising construction. So every bit of disturbed area that happens on your property, I'll paint out. It won't be the contractor doing it, it won't be Nathan. I'll also mark all elevations. There's a lot of paint that's used in a bunker renovation, even more than any aspect that we do. Um, but we'll be marking everything out. I will visit once a week during construction, making sure that the contractor is doing what we need to do. And they'll know I'll be coming every Tuesday or whatever day it will be. They'll count on having certain things in progress for, for us as we, as we go. Again, same kind of chart, not as many topics, but we'll, we'll have that. All of that goes in to the planning phase so that we can properly bid this job, hire an excellent contractor, and be successful through the process. These are erosion control details. There's other details. There's also technical specifications, which dictates the sand and where we're getting it from, where we're getting the grass from, that kind of stuff. So here's a little sample of, of sort of a, a, a a little bit of what we do. Um, this is the 17th hole down at Dunwoody Country Club in Atlanta. Um, there's a greens plan. We did, redid, redid everything around this green, but I, I kind of want to show you the point of some of the things I've been talking about. Not sure why there was an orange bunker, but there is. But, but five bunkers around, around the course, and I would call this par three, re, re, really requiring the players to be perfect. There's no bailout, there's no option, there's no way to navigate. So we went in and disturbed the area around the green and, and the putting surface. But when you get into this picture, you see we took out a front right bunker. Now, the members of the club there looked at me, and especially the good players, they, and we took out 12 greenside bunkers on this course. 12 greenside bunkers were removed. All the good players looked at me and said, you're making the golf course too easy. And I said, just wait. OK, wait till you play it. OK, absolutely. And so it opened it up the ability to navigate is there. Now, you see a, a left-hand hole location. For the, for the average golfer, that is the hardest because it's well protected by bunkers. The funny thing is the hardest hole location on that green right there for the better player is front right. Used to be a bunker, no longer a bunker. The reason it's the hardest one is a little bit psychological in the fact that we rarely have exactly the perfect club when we play golf. We're kind of in between. You know, oftentimes you're choosing between two clubs, trying to figure out which one you use. With no bunker there, player might be tempted to push the lesser club a little bit harder, thinking they can get there. There's no bunker to worry about. If there was a bunker there, I'm telling you, the, the, the best players are always going to go over the bunker, into the green, putt back to the hole, no problem. Well, this one is not the case. You come up short, you've got a, a challenging little chip shot. Conversely, you play the forward tees or the middle tees, and you're hitting a longer club with less spin, you've got a way to actually run the ball onto the green, or if you come up just short right, you're happy to be in grass and not sand. So that's an ex exact example of a hold that, that really would be easier for the average player and actually neutral or, or a little bit harder for the better player. And so we'll do that as we look at your golf course. So all those charts go into a budgeting system. And when we do a project, even with a bunker renovation, there's going to be about 20 line items that you go through. This chart shows the line item, the quantity, the cost, and the budget. That's an easy budget for everybody to look at, and it's a nice one-page thing. But we go a step further. We do a, 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 an eight-page budget on a full project. But on, on your project, it's about five pages. But we go line item by line item and hole by hole. Every one of those numbers you saw on those charts feeds right into this budget. Okay, And so we're really accurate in, in what we're forecasting and then really accurate in managing the project through construction. So I've even got a couple of pages of yours. We've gone ahead and estimated your full project. This is just a couple pages. But, but there are things like different types of shaping. Um, there's bunker demo. Actually, you have to pay money to get them to destroy the bunker, but it's true. Because um, they've got to take the sand somewhere. If there's pipe in the ground, if there's rock, they've got to get it out. So all of that actually costs money. 
And then bunker construction, irrigation, finished work, grassing, all those things go in. And we've already established an estimated budget on your project. We've actually measured your existing bunkers, and we've estimated what we think the future should hold for the bunkers, which is a little bit more, not much. I don't think your golf course needs a lot of bunkering, um, but I think there's nothing wrong with going you know, with one or two more if the situation is right. We don't know where that is yet because we have not fully done this design work. I've been up here one time, put together this, talked to the committee about what I see, and so that's why, that's why we're here. Uh, once we get the project approved, you'll see a lot more of us and doing all our homework, studying everything. But again, we've already started today with the drone work and topography. So a little bit of my work just to show you some things. Um, this is a Ross course in Chattanooga. That was the before, this is the after. A force carry on this hole, nothing but, nothing but bunkers, okay? Um, and, you know, in the opposite of what I believe. Now, the new hole, the new hole does have, is well bunkered, but it is the exact Ross configuration. So we, we, we follow the history. And I have worked on four George Cobb courses and am an admirer of his work, and, and that matters. So and that will be taken into consideration on the things that we do. Uh, notice this one. Notice the railing and the pump station on the right side, because that's the same hole. And it's a breathtaking par three, right on the Tennessee River. So it's just, it's just a stunning place. Uh, the Oaks Country Club is in Tulsa. It's a tilling house we did in 2015. It was selected fourth best redo in America for that year. Uh, Jack Nicholas and Tom Fazio and one other guy had works that were picked ahead of it, but we were pretty proud of that, of that statistic, and that's the new, the new, new version. Uh, Wildcat Cliffs is George Cobb on uh, Highlands, North Carolina. Anybody played there? Okay, not too far. Um, Anyway, that's a redo of the second hole. This is kind of a good one, too, for that talk I was giving. So if you look at the forward tee in the mid-left section of the, of the image, you'll see a hemlock tree and a pond, and there's not much room for anything else, okay? Uh, not very user-friendly, and now the hemlock's still there. The pond was enlarged. Why did we enlarge the pond? One, we, we wanted to see it better, but more importantly, we needed the dirt, okay? So, so oftentimes, you're doing things because of what you're wanting to do. So we, we needed the dirt from the pond, but you'll see the T positioning now. We shifted the green to the right, which made that shot to the green harder, but we opened up the left side. So there's more playable area. There's more area to miss the green. There's more area to navigate your way around trouble. And so that's just the, the philosophy that we will be bringing to your golf course. More playable area around the greens, a little bit more containment, um, and bunkers that look better. And, and these, some of these don't have anything to do with you, but it's, it's kind of nice to see something of what it was and what it can become. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think about, and here's a, here's a good example too. This is a, a, another hole at Dunwoody where I took out a greenside bunker. And so, Two things happened on this hole. The first bunker was five and a half feet deep on the right side. Now it's four feet deep. That foot and a half makes a difference on getting out of the bunker, on seeing your ball land, on all of those things. But we took out the left bunker, and you, you never would know that it ever existed. So if we remove a bunker here, you're never going to know it ever existed. And so we want to make sure that those kind of things blend very nicely. Uh, this is kind of fun. I just finished this job um, up in Minnesota. It was a Seth Rayner redo, and we had a, a quasi-Redan hole, but it really wasn't one. And now we have one of the bolder Redans in America, and it is, it's a stunning hole. The members are just ecstatic. It's crazy. It's kind of a crazy hole. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very bold architecture, but it, it turned out absolutely beautifully. Okay, so what does a bunker renovation look like? Okay, what, what goes into it? Because you guys just want good, consistent sand. But there's a lot that goes on underneath. So these, this shows you a drainage, typical drainage pattern. And there are several different types of bunkers that you will hear about, and it really is about construction method, not design. You may have heard about the Better Billy Bunker. That's really popular, um, and a lot of people know about it. Or capillary concrete or Sand Trapper 2. All these are liner systems, which help drainage 
help keep the sand clean, all of those things. So this just shows you, you know, a nice pattern of drainage um, inside the bunker. You see how clean the edge is. And, and those edges are only four inches high. They're very, con very consistent around the entire bunker. Now you're seeing a bit of, this is, this is a better billy bunker, um, a liner. Um, and you're starting to see us grass. So this is a good time to address what does a bunker renovation look like and what does it, how does it affect the club. First of all, you do not close your golf course during a bunker renovation. Okay, It's about as simple a project that impacts the way the course looks in such a dramatic way, yet does not impact the, your enjoyment of the course as much as you might expect. At Druid Hills, this course, we never closed a hole. I don't recommend that. My contractor, they were a little crazy, and they worked right through golf balls. Okay, I didn't particularly like it, but we normally close one hole at a time. Okay, and off, if you're doing a fairway bunker, we just have that whole play as a par three, and we kind of move on. So what happens? Well, as soon as we get a bunker, a certain amount of bunkers in pretty good shape, in other words, 9,000 square feet of surrounding area ready, we bring in a truckload of sod because that's what sod comes in, a truckload of 9,000 feet. So as soon as we have that, we're taking the bunkers that have been preliminary work done, we're finishing them, grassing them, and off we go. That hole's back open, okay? And so that happens pretty quickly it's, while we're still working on others. You will have ground under repair, okay? But some people don't really mind that so much because it's a free drop. And um, you drop the ball out of the bunker, you're like, hey, I'm shooting, I'm shooting a little bit lower scores here, and, and it's not bad. So it's, it, and it's also, quite honestly, it's really exciting because you get to watch it take shape. Now, schedule-wise for you guys, the ideal time would probably be to start March 1st. So you won't even be seeing it because most people wouldn't necessarily be here or playing at that time. I would assume that you get into really busier April 1st to May 1st, somewhere in that time. We'd be halfway finished before you even show up. Um, so so that's, it's not that inconvenient for you guys to go through the process. This is the, the Sand Trapper 2 liner. It goes through the whole bunker. This is, it comes in strips, though. And it is the bunker liner that I showed you at Chattanooga Golf and Country Club. Those bunkers are 13 years old, and they're as good today as when we built them. And, and you go, well, wow, that's pretty good. Why is that? Well, a couple reasons. We create a, basically a crest line around our bunker and no water comes in from outside the bunker, runs down the slope, and then into the bunker and washes it. So we're controlling water around the bunker, which is why we can't just gut a bunker, take out the old sand, put in new sand, because if you do that, you're going to be right back where you are today in such a short period of time that you go, well, that was a waste. Why did we bother with that? You've got to change the way the water flows around the bunker in order to be successful for this long term. So that's Dunwoody. They have, they have the Sand Trapper 2 liners. Country Club of Sapphire Valley in Cashiers, North Carolina. Another George Cobb. They have this same lining system as does Wildcat Cliffs. And we've got numerous others. But it, it is a really good system. It's not as expensive as the Better Billy or Capillary Concrete. It's, it's much more reasonably priced. OK, and these are just some finished bunkers. And just think about how beautiful your golf course is and how good it will look with sand that is an amenity to the project, to the property, rather than something that's just not quite right, which you've dealt with for a long time. So, so picture your golf course with, with, with these type of bunkers. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit about your course. And I'm not going every hole. I'm just going to talk about a few things. But let's just look at number one, for example. And, and we don't have any plans yet. So everything I'm saying is just off the top of, of our first impression of the golf course, and that's really one, one visit. But I would trim that left side of that front right bunker probably 10 to 12 feet. I would create a little more grass approach into the green. And then I'd go to that hump on the left side of the green, and I'd actually take that out, because that's going to generate dirt for me. And I would cut that, cut that down and create a little bit more fairway chipping area on that left side, which kept balls in play rather than bouncing away. It would keep balls in play, and it would, um, it, it would be a nice area to miss. If you, if you don't like bunkers, you're going to navigate away, and that would be a nice fairway cut area on that hole. <laughs> uh, third hole. 
So the third hole, we've got two bunkers, um, very, very common setup. I do like the way the front right bunker works, but I'd take that left bunker and I'd actually shove it from the middle of the green to, behind, to back and I'd open up from middle of the green to the front of the green on the left side. Again, bent grass, fairway cut. And the reason, I'm doing that for a couple reasons. One is you walk from that cart path on the left side onto that green and you have to walk around the bunker. If I create more grass space, then we don't get as much wear pattern, sorry, we don't get as much wear and tear, um, wear and tear around the green, plus it sort of gives you an offset. So depends on hole location. So back left hole location, that left bunker is really in play. Front left, not so much. And you get a little bit more diversity around the green with that kind of setup. It won't look that much differently, although our bunkers will look a tiny bit more set into the ground um, than what you have, have now. And this is a perfect example. So that right bunker on five sits up about on grade with the green. That's four. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, it sits up, up on grade almost with the green. I would take it and slide it back just a little bit and drop it down probably three and a half feet below the, the collar level so it fits into the ground just a little bit more and then where that big front lobe is we'd have um, we'd also drop it down in front of the bunker so you, your fairway approach would be level drop down in front of the bunker still in grass and still in bent grass and you'd widen out that front approach but yet the narrow part still would be there so it, it'd be as challenging to run it on but you'd have more shots that weren't necessarily sand and a little bit more variety of elevation in front of that green. That's a really nice area to work with on that hole. Next time I speak to you, I'll know the holes. Um, and so really like this setup. And this is a really good example of a lot of square footage that doesn't quite have to be there. So we can take, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> fifth hole, uh, sixth hole, sixth hole. I actually did know that. Um, that must be nerves or something. Um, but we would take this hole and we would continue with two bunkers. I love the setup. I think it's a beautiful, very attractive hole. But we would reduce square footage slightly, okay? And, and reducing bunker square footage at $4.50 to $5 a square foot adds up. If I save 1,000 square feet on this and you can't tell on bunker size and I just saved us $5,000, that's, that's helpful. And we'll do that. And, and so we've measured already all the sizes of the bunkers. And that's one we could do that. This picture's not in there. Any other reason to say, hey, we can't have a cart path right in front of a green. Um, so in the long run, um, you know, one of the things about what we'd be establishing here is a bit of a relationship. Okay, if you guys like what I did with the bunkers and, and, and like, you know, what, what we're doing with tees, you're going you're gonna to want, you're gonna want a long-term relationship with a golf course designer and say, okay, we can't have that car path right in front of the green, but yet we need to access the green. We need it, the walk-on to be easy, but we don't want it there. What do we do? We're not dealing with that now, but that's something that would, would be part of, again, establishing a relationship between myself and you guys. You don't need, a, you don't need sand on that home. No, I know. I agree. But I don't like the cart path, <laughs> although I'm sure that you get the bounce off the cart path, and occasionally that works out well. Okay, exactly. When I did the Oaks in Tulsa, it was funny because all the car paths round down the edge of the fairway, and, and I was out studying the golf course, and I'd hear, hit the path! And, and, and that was, they, they, and you could tell they were hoping, you know, because it was going to be a good thing, but, but it's not really what we want. Okay, so on a, course, on a course that only has 20 or 21 bunkers, to have four on the same hole is a bit, you know, is a bit much. So I recommend two on this hole. Um, I would eliminate the back left bunker, cut that area down, and actually create a grass, more of a grass, grassy low, but with containment. So your ball stays in play, but I just generated a whole bunch of dirt, okay, that I can use in other places. On the right side, we've got that beauty, okay, and we, we'd eliminate that one and keep, probably keep the front right one, but we haven't strategized the whole course yet. So, so that's part of the process that I have to educate myself now on how this course plays you know, we'll even look at bunker front right, bunker front left, middle. We'll look at the counts and look for balance, okay, so that you guys get good variety and your holes play differently because that's part of the fun of golf is, is having different results. You know, when you go play the same golf course day in and day out, you want to look forward to that next day just as much as today 
but you would like variety in, in playing, and most people would of the same course. So that's one that would be, be fixed. And then, um, you know, this whole, you know, as I was telling the guys earlier, it's a bit, you, you've, got, you've got the pond, but you're not really using it. Not that balls don't go in it, because I'm sure they do. But, but typically with a hazard like that, you'd either want the green closer to it, or you could bunker in between there and open up the left side a little bit more. I don't know what the answer to this hole yet, but we will be, uh, it will be one that's fun to challenge. No it's a fun true. challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 17, so you guys, saw, you guys saw a bunch of before and after pictures of my work. This one will be as good as anything you saw. This has got good bones. This is one I can't wait to, to tackle. And a couple things. Um, the back left bunker could be eliminated. Again, we'll drop off behind the green, and we'll drop off and rise up and drain out to the left. The balls will stay in play right there. They won't get to those trees in the back. I like, I like a back right bunker, but I might, I might let it meander a little bit more around the right side slightly. The left bunker is in a good position, but you know it'll, it, it won't, it actually, um, won't be flashed as much as it is, and there'll be good water diversion. And then one of the things that I really like the idea is having a, an approach here that is a great place to miss the green. Right now, you, you're kind of encouraging balls over here. And as I teased the guys earlier, that's harder to hit than that because it's narrow and at an angle. Okay, so, so it doesn't coordinate very well, but we bring and drop down a shelf. So we might drop that down, again, about three feet below the green and have it a nice area where it's just a, a low approach in front of the green. And we can even have one side a little higher where you can run the ball on and one side a little bit lower, but that would show off that green. And then this right side would be reduced. We'd still have fairway. The fairway line might come down, wrap here, come down in this area, and then wrap around. But well, that would help you not roll down into the hole, okay? Because that shelf, a lower shelf, would keep balls, keep balls there. Um, but this is a, that's a great looking hole, just waiting to be um, waiting to be adjusted. And then the 18th, um, in this phase, we are looking at just redoing that bunker. Um, the committee knows that that I look at that hole, and I and I I know the cart pass should not be on the same side as the as the lake. If you can avoid cart pass being next to hazards, you should. Sometimes you can't, okay? But that green belongs right over here, okay? And that cart path belongs over here, and you would have a killer finishing hole that you would sit up here on that patio, on that porch, and look out and go, wow, okay? That's not something that's in our plan, okay? But, but it is something that is recognized. So that's a little bit... Of our, you know, and this, there's nothing, there's nothing Nathan can do about that, okay? <laughs> and he just can't, and it's demoralizing because he doesn't want to give you guys something that looks like that. But there's nothing he can do about it um, without us coming in with proper equipment and technique. So that's a little bit about what we've done so far. Um, it is, it is still the introduction phase, quite honestly. And as soon as you guys approve the project. I'll be on board and we'll come up and spend the appropriate time to really learn about you guys, learn about your course, and um, help you guys take it to the next level. So thank you very much. Uh, we're taking moderator's privilege and make a couple of comments. Uh, you can see this is not just replacing the sand in the bunkers. We have, we're putting, we're going to make this course a wow factor in there with all these kinds of renovations. Uh, you will understand that what he has give, given us is a budget, an estimate that he has. After he does his design work and the club has approved his design, we will then put it out for bids. And so we will see what it is. But he assured us that his estimates are we're solid are solid uh, and um, the other thing I want to call your attention to is the practice bunker up here uh, Bill doesn't like the way the the 
the thing was contoured around it. However, there is a drainage system under that bunker that is the same drainage system that he is recommending to us. And it has in it the type of sand that he has recommended to us. And after the major storm hit us, the only thing Nathan had to do was go out there and rake it. Okay? So, with that, uh, we're going to have some committee chairs make comments. Uh, we'll start with Mike Carlton from the Greens Committee. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Greens Committee, I'm, I'm pleased to announce um, our approval of this project. We, we believe it's an important project for the club and would benefit us in the long run. Um, we also strongly believe that we need to fix the bunkers the right way. The, the worst thing we could do is to, to do the bare minimum and in one night have it washed away. And uh, Bill told us the story. Your mic, I can hear you. Sure. Um, Bill told us a story this afternoon of a club who did exactly just that. They, they did the bare minimum and the same thing happened again. So, you know, I think it would, would make sense for us to, to spend the money to do it the right way to start with. Um, we're excited about some of the ideas he's put, put forth so far and uh, we ask for your support to move this forward. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Yarbrough is going to come talk to us, represent the golf committee. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I represent the golf committee, and the golf committee has uh, said it would love to do this and voted for it. Uh, you know, it's never a great time to spend money and never a great time to do any renovations. I kind of found that, found that out when I did my house. Uh, and, and if you don't know me, uh, if you've ever found an Audi ball, I'm the I'm person who hit the Audi ball and lost it. But I'm like Bill, uh, you know, I don't know the, the holes either, but I'm just saying, <laughs> it, it's really, it's, it's time. You know, it, we've had, it's 54 years. You know, this is not expense, it's investment. This could put High Meadows on the map and in ratings in North Carolina. We've got several guys in this room that's on the committee. It could really put people investing back in, and we've been very fortunate in the last two years. It's been great up here. Uh, it, land's been selling, houses been selling, we've had new members, it's fantastic. But we need to keep growing. The one thing that's gonna help us uh, is members. You know, I'm a member of a club in Winston-Salem, Hadn't played there in three months. Hadn't been open in three months. Uh, but they have the members. They have the number of members. But, you know, we're not going to have to close the club. It's going to be closed one hole at a time. This is, it's time that we, 54 years with the drainage, with no drainage. And I've never seen it rain like it did, uh, what, a month ago, a month and a half ago. And uh, we need to be prepared. I think we got one estimate, and I may be wrong on the dollar amount, but it's $150,000 to redo the bunkers and put sand in it that would wash away next if we had another rain like we did. And we know sometimes it's going to rain. We're down 300 rounds this year, and that's not good. You know, we've had, this year we offered, we had uh, 10 rounds for $500. Uh, in fact, I'm talking to the, our committee about extending the time on those and offering them again, you know, for next year. But, uh, you know, it's just been times we just couldn't play. We've had several events. The MGA event, canceled just one day. The member guest, which you had some guests come up. But thank goodness that uh, Mike, Nathan, canceled it before, you know, on the Thursday before. It was canceled on Tuesday. So uh, I, I'll hush up. I know we want to get out sometime, but I think it's a great time to invest in our property and our club. Thank you.
I have said to you a couple of times in my speeches and my thing, how bad is this on the move again? You know, we have sold 18 houses this year. We have 14 new members this year. How bad is this on the move again? We need to keep it going. We need to keep it going. So with that, I'll have Bob Reed come. I'm going to try this without the mic. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, because Marie says when I talk on the phone, you talk way too loud. Everybody in the neighborhood can hear you. So, um, and anyway, Saturday's our 34th wedding anniversary. So, yeah, pretty happy about that. I told her I was surprised she stayed with me this long, and she said she was too. Um, anyway, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Bill for coming up on such short notice. Uh, to come up and review the course and talk about our golf course and and be willing to take his time to do that. I mean, it was, and thank Nathan uh, for having the contact and, and calling Mr. Bergen. When I came up here, I guess that was on uh, Thursday, and rode around with Mike and, and Nathan and saw everything and I thought, holy cow, what in the world has happened? You know, this, this is unbelievable uh, to see what had occurred because of that storm. And, <clears throat> and I started just, just thinking about what in the world are we going to do? I mean, it's already this year we faced a lot of adversity. Um, there's, there's been a lot of storms that have occurred. I mean, God, God bless Nathan and his staff. I mean, you think back to October last year when the tornado came through and took out all the trees, and then the March storm, and then this. I mean, a lot has occurred. And <laughs> you know, the, the, the one thing I think about is I think about this place and, and when I first came up here and, and I came up many years ago and played golf and I thought man this is this place is special I mean this is one of the best golf courses that I've ever played and um, it, it's exciting and, and then Marie and I and Peggy knows that uh, I think she got tired because I'd come up, with, we'd get in the car and ride up here on a Sunday afternoon and I'd call her and say, hey Peggy, can you show us this house, you know? And we did that for like two years. And, uh, you know, fi finally she said, I've had enough of you, Bob Reed, you needed to do something. And so, you know, we did. And uh, we've loved it a lot. And I mean, great people, some, some of the best I've ever been around. And what, what I like about it is the fact that you've got a golf course here that, that couples can play, men and women can play together. We've got a lot of couples events, a lot of things. It, it's a great golf course for everybody. But you know, we, we've been kind of stuck in neutral for a long time. And you know, the, the storm, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it happened. But you know what? Now's the time to step up. Now's the time to rally. Now's the time for us to get together and say, you know what? We're going to do this, and we're going to make it right. And I would be totally remiss if I didn't thank Pete Ramey. Pete came up here, and he brought his crew up here, and he... I mean, Pete, thank you. And everybody needs to thank you. I mean, he spent a lot of time with those guys and went around and, and I mean, crawled through culverts. <coughs> looked in the, 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 the streams down here on 13 and the bridges, um, he did a lot. He, he brought his camera and, 
and went through all the culverts and we were in there looking at them the other day and I apologize for saying this, but I said it looked like a colonoscopy. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of looking at all the stuff going on. But, yeah. but uh, he, he's, helped, he's helped us a lot. He's helped us with the immediate things that we needed to get done, and we figured out a way to get that done. Now I get to deliver the good news. The good news is, is we've got a chance to make an investment in our property here. If we didn't have this golf course, I just want you to think about what it would be like with your personal home. What would the value be? Who, who wants to come up here and, you know, not have anything to do, can't play golf? And so, so I look at this as an investment. I look at this as an opportunity for us as a step one. And, and, and Mr. Bergen talked about it and we talked about it in our meetings, trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. What is the thing that we need to do to really start the process of getting new members? And that's the whole key. He told us in his meetings that, that the places where he has worked and the work that he has done, and, and in more than just this, but in total, total renovations, that the membership has increased and in the last four courses, and quote me if I'm not right, but now they have a waiting list. Yeah, our last four major renovations. Major renovations, list. they have a waiting list at the courses. And we asked him, number one, we said, what is the thing that, that you do that creates the wow factor? And, and he said, your, your sand traps. He said, when you look at the golf course, and if you can just imagine sitting out here and, and looking at number uh, 18 and how that could look when it's done and number one and then standing up on the tee box on number 10 and seeing what that looks like, it, it, it's going to make a huge difference. The other thing that we talked about doing and we all realize this is that we, we need to think about the next step. We need to be planning for the future. Our tees need work desperately. We've got to do something with our tees. And he is, is willing to help us with that and give us a price to look at how, what, what it's going to take to do that. And then there'll be some other small things that, w that we can do. So I just, I just want us to think about that. But anyway, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, is we're looking at about $16,700 per trap to get this work done. It's going to work out to $328 a month for six months. Or you can pay it all up front at one time, $1,968. Total cost is $350,000. That's an estimate. The key is, is that, that once we contract him to do this and we start working and getting the estimates from the contractors, then hopefully we'll be able to trim those numbers down. But he feels very good that that's probably what it's going to be. What this will mean is it'll, it'll mean, uh, an, I'm going to call it an investment, an assessment to the membership. It would be effective if this is voted on in the uh, September meeting and we would, we would start on October 1st. Again, you can pay it all at one time or you could pay it on a monthly basis for six months. In our meeting today, uh, Dan brought up a, I saw Dan just a minute ago, I don't remember, there he is. Dan brought up a good point about, well, maybe we should wait a couple months and start. And the finance committee discussed that. And we thought, you know, hey, maybe we wait a couple months before we do it or we start, excuse me, we start the first of the year. But we felt like that the best thing to do was to go ahead and get all our funds in place so that when he starts the work in March, that the money's already there, we're ready to get it done, we're ready to pay for it, we pay the contractors on a timely basis, and we get this work done so that by the 1st of June or end of May, in May sometimes, our golf course is completely open and ready to go. The other part that he said was, I think it's important, is that we would not have to close the golf course. We can just do it one hole at a time. And uh, 
I know if I was out there working on it, I wouldn't want to have the hole open and people hitting golf balls at me. So I, I would recommend doing that. Uh, the assessment would be for all members other than dining members. And we, we researched the bylaws to make sure that that was, was correct. We looked at other options. And uh, you know, we looked at potentially even doing financing on it, but it's going to cost more to do that as far as on a per member basis if we did something like that. And we just felt like the best option was to go ahead and to do the, the assessment and pay for it either have the option to do it at one time or over a six month period. So the finance committee fully supported it and the board fully supported it as well. And I hope that each of you will support it. Thank you. Well, you've gotten a full load, and the floor is now open for questions and discussion. Yes, sir. Is there any way to produce an overlay, a picture of what it would look like, like your finished holes that you've done, where you show the before and after? Is there a way to create a model? Um, yes, and we, we've done a Photoshop um, one hole we just did a job in Oklahoma where we did that before we started the job and um, so, yeah it can be done you pick a hole and say okay maybe number 10 the one that has four bunkers and, and we can Photoshop it into the new design so. and when when he does his architectural work he would submit it to the club for approval yeah and we would approve his designs the club would approve his designs before we began construction Yes. Uh, can you talk about the sand? Yeah. How would it be different? Where would it come from? Yeah, the sand we're, we're recommending is G Angle. It's the same sand you saw at Druid Hills uh, in Atlanta. It's a great sand. Um, and sand it's, it's, it's the same sand as in your practice bunker, although I haven't stepped in your practice bunker. But uh, G Angle is a very popular sand um, in the southeast. It's a. Um, um, firmer. Yeah, it's, it's firmer than average, wouldn't you say? but not overly firm. So you've got two different types of sand out there. I mean, you've got lots of types of sand, but you've got basically your rounder particle sand drains really well. It is soft, and sometimes you get buried lies. Your angular sand knits together very tightly, doesn't drain as well, and is hard, firm when you step in it. G-angle would be on the firmer side of middle, but not as firm as SP55, which a lot of North Carolina courses have, which was the Augusta National sand. They still get it. Nobody else can get it. But it's a it's a really nice performing sand, and um, you know Druid Hills is fantastic. I mean, in Atlanta, and the sand is just perfect. So, but Golf Agronomics is the company that supplies that. I don't even know where it comes from. You know where it comes from? Uh, down on Pinehurst. Oh, Pinehurst area. Not not far from Pinehurst. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Alan, can I ask a question? I'm not much of a golf. I'm not a golfer. I'm taking lessons. I'm hoping, but. Uh, if you're saying in addition to doing the bunkers, which is fine, uh, you said that we need to do something with the teams, right? Yes. Yes. How much would it be seeing that they're in here doing this now? Add it on. Um, we're going to work. Question. Yeah, so the question was how much would it be to do the tees at the same time? Um, we haven't done a budget for the tees yet. That's, that's a simple calculation, but I actually need to spend time doing that, and I told these guys I'd have it for them first next week. I think so, you should consider that. I, yeah, mean, I, I, I agree. <clears throat> that, well, now we're asking only for financing to do the bunkers. If we decide we will get the estimate to do the tees, yeah. And if the club wants to do them together, we'll have to obviously have to address the financing question at that time when we know what it is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think we should. Paul? Uh, I've got a question and a comment. The first question is, what is your, uh, I get the estimate, and, and I know the board has done a great job vetting all of this. What is the, the process to ensure cost control once we 
once we figure out whatever that number is, what is your process? For After the contractor starts? Yeah. And then yeah. My comment, my comment, Nathan, what you and your team have done in the last 18 months is beyond miraculous. Appreciate it. So the, the question was about cost controls once we start construction. And so I do all layout, 100% of layout, so I'm off, based off the plans. All elevations are done that. I've not argued one yard of dirt in 28 years, not one. Okay, we, our plans are excellent. And we, we, we go by them each week. And we send site visit notes after every visit. Um, you guys are being well informed about everything that's happened. That budgeting system, every single piece of thing that happens out there, whether it's grass, dirt, sand, all slides right into that on, you know, each time something's completed, each time the contractor's invoiced. So my, that's my job. That's what I do. Yes? Um, I'm guessing that there's a limited number of contractors that can do this type of work. There are. It's, it's half art and it's half construction. And so um, we, we work with, I work with six different golf course contractors. There are plenty more out there, but I have six that I keep doing business with because I like them and I, and I like their work. Um, it's not necessarily a job that you want to start with somebody new because I've got people who know how to build these just right. And, um, and even though I don't have a personal, I don't have any financial situation with them, but I, I know they're going to have my best interest in quality of construction. And we've got, we have various levels of contractors. I've got A contractors and I've got B contractors. And the A contractors, the finished work, you could sit and have a picnic on the dirt. The B contractors, not so much, but they're cheaper, okay? And so there is, there is a balance there. And we'll bid both ways, but we wouldn't bid anybody that we wouldn't feel like would give us a good job. So, oh, back over here, lady. Capital reserve fund was how much of that is already committed to projects that are underway, and was it viewed at all as a possible source of funding in whole or in part of this project? Uh, the current capital fund budget that I sent out this couple of days ago, that spreadsheet shows at the moment uh, an un. Uh, a, a balance at the end of the year of thirty thousand uh, dollars. Now we're holding that money for contingencies. You know, if an air conditioning system goes down in this building, or something like that, that that's kind of a reserve for contingencies. But right now, that fund is projected at a thirty thousand dollar balance at the end of the year. Okay. Yes, sir. Put a cap on the cost overruns on this particular quote. Is there, say, a 5% cap, 10% cap? Uh, in other words, we're estimating out it's going to be 300 and whatever thousand, 2,000 a member, basically. What, who's going to pay for the cost overruns if there are some? And are they capped to a certain amount? You want me to answer? We, don't, we won't go over. Um, <laughs> I, I, you, just, you just heard it right. No, and I can say it comfortably. I've been doing this for 28 years. We have the best planning, budgeting, and construction management business there is. And this is a small project. I mean, it's big to you guys. I know it's really, it is really big and it's really important. But it's, a, it's not a job that has a lot of risk um, because we're not moving a bunch of dirt. We're, we're not, it just doesn't have, there's not a lot of weather events that can even harm a job like this. Don't say that. No, there really isn't. There really isn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me let me let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of I'm in the middle of a, a fairly large job in Oklahoma City. In the middle of construction, we had a four-inch rain in an hour on a bunker and greens renovation. Okay, we had minor damage. We had no erosion issues. I got a text last night from one of the guys on the committee. He called it, we had another biblical storm yesterday. He goes, bunkers are perfect. Good. Yeah, it's a, this is, this is in, in the construction world for golf, this is pretty easy, this, this type of work. So. Um, I'd have to look. 
If, if I was, if you now here, you asked the question. If I was going to say what contingency do you need? Fifteen thousand. I need fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Okay. That's what I need. That's what I like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm from Florida. You know, yeah. I get it. And do I want? Do would I like the fifteen thousand contingency? Absolutely, I would like it. But but that's all I need. So. Next questions. Hands. In the back. Now, I promise Kate I would not say a word. But, <laughs> but I think I like what he showed. I'm in favor of it. But as whoever else spoke over there about the tea bottles, I would hate for us to do all of that and we have to go up on six, eleven, two, and have three sets of teas on the same small tea bottles. I think we should definitely get that in our Questions. Questions. Yeah. So let me. Can I can I address teas a little bit? Can I talk about teas? Sure. Okay. So, a really, we're we're I'm involved in this really cool program that you should look up, called the Longleaf Tea Initiative. It's not on there. It's not on there. Um, the Longleaf Tea Initiative examines the way people play golf, and it recommends tea positioning based on how far you carry a driver. Okay, And it's a joint venture between US Kids Golf, who I did their course in Piners called Longleaf for, the ASGCA, which is my architect's organization, and the USGA. We believe this is the wave of the future. Um, so it's based on how far you carry a driver. Now, here's an interesting statistic. If you only carry a driver 100 yards, and I know there's people in the room that, that qualify for that, 100 yards, you should play a golf course that's only, the, the 18 hole length is 3,200 yards to experience the same type of golf that Dustin Johnson plays at 8,000 yards. He doesn't play 8,000 yards and you don't play 3,200. But what we found is there is a mathematical objective amount that sets up a golf course properly so that it's not that you shoot a bunch of lower scores, but you hit more greens in regulation. And as a teacher at Cherokee Town and Country Club when I was in, in the 80s, I taught the women club champions at the course. And they could break 80, but they could not shoot par. Why couldn't they shoot par? Because they couldn't hit every green in regulation under the best of circumstances because the golf course was too long. That doesn't happen in the men's world, okay? But what you're seeing out there in the golf world, so we're, we're adding forward tees on every course that I'm building, every single one. And we're positioning the tees, all of them properly, so that you get the best experience based on how far you carry a driver. And it's been a nice thing because the play it forward system is so vague, people go, well, what does that mean and where should I play and why? This actually is, is a concrete thing. However far you carry a driver, we have a recommendation. I th we're taking it to every golf course we can. Now, we're not going 3,200 very often, but we're really going in the low fours on all these courses. And that's a great yardage for people to play. And so when we look at the tees, we're going to look at, look at all of that. But we haven't done that yet. When we started talking about tees today, I think it's very important. But, but it, um, my assistant made a really good comment today. He said, the wow factor of the bunkers is going to help you with new members so you can pay for the tees. Um, and that would, the reverse would not happen um, the same way. But it's not a question of it not being short enough for the ladies. It's quality. The men will be on our tee box and they go in with a sandwich. Exactly. And see, so, we're talking about distribution yeah. and quality. And when we look at the tees. Pushing everything forward and push everything on the ladies' tee box. So we stay on a beat up tee box all the time. Right, and we'll look at distribution, quality, and, and all of that. So, so all of that will be examined, but that's why we, have, we just haven't done it yet. So. But it's, um, it's important, and it, and it really, really will be something that benefits the club, and it will keep players enjoying the game longer, and that's a really important thing. And it's great for your grandkids, too. It all, it all evolved out of, out of Dan Van Horn, who owns U.S. Kids Golf. He said, if you achieve excellence, no matter what your age, you should be able to shoot par. Well, you've got some really great 80-year-old golfers here that can't shoot par because the golf course doesn't fit them. 
And his point was, I've got some really good six-year-old golfers that can't shoot par because the golf course doesn't fit them. And that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to make the golf course fit the player more. In, in, in the years past, it's always been the player conforming to the course. And this is a little bit different. Oh. Just wanted but to mention that they, um, the construction of the T boxes will include laser leveling so that the surfaces of them are entirely flat, which I'm yes. sure that was clear. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of the positioning of the tees, it's not just that your new tees will get better. We will add tees so that you don't have to share. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Uh, the comment I'm about to make is based on the fact that I only have 15 days and 12 hours left in this job. <laughs> He's got a stopwatch. Only if the bump is replaced. The board has appropriated $25,000 to uh, pay Bill to develop a full T plan, architectural plan for the course. And let me tell you, that's, that, it doesn't cost that much. That includes construction supervision and the whole bit. So you won't be going down that road yet. But, but part of that will go towards developing the plan. Yeah. We'll, we'll go over it with you, and then we do the construction drawings that are necessary for it, that. It will be the job of my successors to decide when the club can afford to do that. Eileen, <laughs> <laughs> how is Al. Eileen uh, has been waiting. Um, is it standard that you would do a project like this and ask our social members to pay the same amount that golf members are paying and we're not making any other improvements to our club? Well, we walked all around that, and this is, this is explicitly the way our bylaws are written and have been that way for several years. Are you concerned you're going to lose a lot of social members? Well, we don't know. Uh, uh, could I make a comment for that? I mean, I, I really hope not, because I hope they look at the big picture. And the big picture is, is if we don't have this out here, then, you know, are we going to be able to attract, you know, those, those types of those dying members? So hopefully they will see the benefit. And, and I want you to know, we, we looked at that very, very carefully. In fact, Lou, in our finance committee, we, we said, let's make sure we understand exactly what the bylaws says. And, and the bylaws are explicit. And they are very explicit. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> but thank you for bringing that up. It's great. John? I don't have a statement. As your humble House Chairman, I was not a big part of all of these discussions. But when Cindy Lee and I came here six and a half years ago, we immediately fell in love with this golf course. But my first impression was these sand traps suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I defy any of you in this room to find fault with that logic. Um, we all know this. We all love this golf course. We love this community. It's, it's, it's been a wonderful part of my retirement. <coughs> Um, I strongly encourage you to vote for this project. We are not asking for tons of money. Nobody in this room is going to be highly taxed by a $2,000 assessment. Um, and the end result will be so wonderful. And as, as Bill said, the last four projects he's worked on, they've gone from no waiting list to an extreme waiting list. We should all be so lucky to have a waiting list here. I, I, I encourage you to consider this strongly and to vote in the positive. Thank you. You're here. Paul wants to say something else. Not yet. I'm just. Someone mentioned seeing if we could get an, at least an estimate on the on the teas at the same time. I think it makes great sense and if we had that information in time for the uh, meeting, uh, I, I, I would strongly propose that we get that information and, and let the, the membership think about that at the same time. Here, here. We're going to be doing this yeah. anyway. Okay. Uh, I would say we would probably do that. Okay. Questions? Anybody? Tell me. One back there. There are about a dozen areas on this golf course that are in the business 
them to get out there and see them. But right now, because somebody's created the line called the white paint for the first time this year. You mentioned it's not just bombers, there's some other things. We're going to address, can we address these areas as part of this project, or not, are we just going to put the on this piece? And part of the, as we, as we evaluated the storm damage, uh, we also identified, I guess, eight or nine drainage problems that exist on the course. That some of them have been there for a long time. Long, some of them were made worse by the storm. Uh, and we will. The, the plan is to address those one by one through the next several months. But not part of this project. It's not part of this project. John, but I will say it is part of what we're going to do because we, we determined we got a list of all the things. And you're exactly right. There's some areas. Let me have a follow-up. What about, what is this project going to do for our labor situation? Because we all know it's terrible. Uh, 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 well, uh, would you stand up and say that again? I didn't get what you said. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will do that. We will make sure all that is done and taken care of. We've got a list of all the things that you talked about as far as some of the, the areas. And I know where you're talking about, where they marked them off with the, with the white. All that stuff has been addressed, and the plan is, is to get that done with as possible. Pete helped on some of those things and is going to continue to help on some of the other things that we're already doing. Well, before I go to this, I want to admit to what you're saying. That if we're going to go in here, we're going to have one of the best partners of the things that Phil's talking about. We ought to at least fix up these miserable planning conditions where we just got a leaky creek right here or the drainage is yeah. for one reason. All, all, that, all that has been identified and we're going to get it done. He just, he yeah, we, we, the last few weeks we've gone through the entire course and we've addressed where we have drainage problems, trees, some of the issues you're talking about. Uh, you have our word as a board, at least my word, as part of the board, to show you that need to get done. I appreciate that. This is the last thing I'll say. It's been like, most of them have been like that for half a dozen years. Yeah, what's changing? Okay. Yeah, it's Well, I would say. John, I would say that when we went through that, one of the things, conclusions I came through this analysis, one of the things I came to is that we have neglected this golf course for a long time, okay? We have not, over the years, invested the maintenance money, the, what he calls the mechanical, to do the mechanical things. We have not, and and we're going to have to address, the budget committee and everything is going to have to address that. And that's as good as I can give you, because the board, the board is is fully aware of all of that, and we'll, you know. Okay. In your, uh, you had another comment back there. I was just going to say, you already appropriated money to do all this stuff. Yeah, but it's not going to be enough. Not all, not all of them. The, the, we, the board, the board allocated sixty-five thousand dollars from the emergency fund to take care of the emergency items, uh, which does not include all the stuff that we that Bob was talking about. In, in, in your analysis of doing the sand traps and all, is it not? Better, or did you talk about redoing everything that needed to be done all at the same time? And instead of 300,000 or 350,000, it might be a lot more, but instead of doing it in stages, to just get it done and build up to be published for a couple of weeks and do it. I mean, that's the way the club that I've been exposed to. Instead of piecemeal, and 
I, I personally feel like if we're going to do it, let's just get the things done, the T's and the drainage and the concrete. We did. Uh, we spent a lot of time on it. Uh, Nathan spent a lot of time. If we don't have, and, and Mike, excuse me for, for talking, but I was, was, was there. We did go over all of that, and we kind of got an, an estimate. But what we felt like was important to the membership at this point in time was to, to at least come to you with getting this, this first phase done with the idea that we can probably do it and we, we can probably make it work by tapping into maybe our line of credit that we have and, and, and seeing how all that ends up. But first of all, we need to get all the prices for it and we're in the process of getting all that done. And once we do, we may have all of that for, for you at our next meeting. And we could vote, we could vote to, to go ahead and appropriate the money to do that. And uh, just on, a, on an estimate basis, it's, it's really not, it's not that much. But uh, we just felt like at this time, we, we felt it was more important to try to keep things at this level <coughs> for now. And but it was priority to get this done and then get those other things done as quickly as possible. Well, we I, want to do that within I it. came in here thinking that it was not something that I would be in favor of. And I was completely flipped and it's something that I'm totally in favor of. It's expensive and I think anything we can do to make this club a first class club as, a, as I felt it was when we came, we need to do it. Exactly what the way you feel, and the the one thing that that we talked about, and in all of our discussions, was let's let's make this where, and I know uh, Terry Owen and, and Ralph and several other members are on the golf panel, North Carolina golf panel. Well, it would be great to get that group up here and let them go through and rate this golf course. And I think Mr. Bergen, you know, talked about it just in some things that, that we could do. He said, you're going to have one of the top-notch golf courses in North Carolina. Bob, regarding the North Carolina golf panel, when Nathan tells us, or tells me, or Terry and Neil, uh, that he's ready for us to come up, that is no problem. They will be here. I think that's important because you want you want to be able to pick up a golf digest and look in there and say, High Meadows, Warren Gap, North Carolina is in the top fifty or top hundred or whatever, top ten, top five in North Carolina. That is what we want to do. We want to have a waiting list for people to come here. We want to see our property value start to go up. And that's important to people. I think it'd be good if John gave us a list of it, what he sees to see if that falls in the uh, state of maintenance or, or project. But it'd be very good to see see those spots. You know, yeah. you can identify and say, okay, that's something maintenance can do, or that's something we push off into the problem. Right. But we're all wanting the same thing. You know? yeah. And I, I, mean, I think we need to move forward with just what we're doing. Hopefully we can have some tea information by the next go around and have some of this other information. And, and I'll be glad to get John. I'll be glad to get with you and, and, and get together and write down the list and go. I think you and I play together enough where you know what I'm talking about. I, I do. I do. And, and I think I, our list, the punch list that we put together, will identify those things that we've talked about. But I would yeah, like. We're not talking about fixing them. I'm sorry to be the dead horse, but we've got to talk about. It. Oh, well, you get my vote. You're talking about it. Well, we want, we want your vote. There's no way you get it. Okay. And, and we'll get it done. Are there other questions?
I'm a new member, been here four months, okay? Came up here, bought a membership, bought a house, great. Glad to have you here. I'm here. <laughs> This is a surprise, but you know what? It's okay. I'm willing to pay you 2000 But I'll tell you what, this is not an equity membership. I have bought into the club to play golf here. Yes, I want to play golf. Of course, it's beautiful. I'll pay more money to get it nice. But you guys have got to think about how, you know, you can't just keep coming to the well, with, especially with a new guy like me. I, I mean, I came from another club. I've been an equity member. I'm paying to play here. Got to pay two more grand to play the course. So you got to think of that when you're talking about new members or you're trying to recruit people like me who don't have a long history here. These guys have played it forever. We I all want that fixed over there because it doesn't rain. I don't want this over here. I don't like playing off the men's tees or whatever. Okay, but you know what? Those are personal concerns of guys who have played here for 10, 10 years. I'm a new member. I'm just happy to be here. The question, though, in my opinion, in my experience, you've got a proposal on the table. you got to vote for that proposal or you have to amend it. If you want to amend it, you've got to add the other things. Otherwise, you've got to vote for the one proposal that's on the table, finite dollars. If you want to amend the proposal, say, no, we're not going to vote. Let's, let's add the new T's. Let's add this to it. But you can't vote now and then create more expenses down the road that we have to vote again for, and another expense down the road that you got to, I want to have one expense that I pay for now, and I'm willing to do it, otherwise, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me for us to continue to incrementally fix things here and there, where's the money going to go, okay? I'm just talking about the bottom line, all right? Okay. Yeah, and, uh, not just, we're asking to invest in the club, and we're asking you to invest in your future of the club. But also, I'd like to recognize one thing. For the people that's on the living tree, if you haven't noticed, we're investing, they're investing, and I uh, know Rich and Mark Stevens, uh, the deck, uh, the new gate at the pool, entrance in the pool when you pass, and I just heard about the tennis courts. So there's a lot of things we're not coming to the well on that people are donating in the living tree. This club has always been pay as you go. This club has always been pay as you go. And when the Great Recession, when the Great Recession hit, because we had no debt, we could ride right through it. And we, I hope this club continues to take that philosophy. Amen. Back in the back. Yeah, I, uh, that's the point. I mean, the newest member. August.
uh, at the September meeting, the, the membership meeting, we passed this this uh, this expenditure, and then we do the, the T's after that. After the two major issues are done, the other things that we want to do to dress up this course are not going to cause an assessment. We're going to be able to handle it internally. So that just want to make that clear. That's as per our treasury. <laughs> at the risk of getting tomatoes thrown at me, um, I see Garrison standing over there, uh, and uh, dinner is probably served. So unless somebody really wants to do that, to say something else, I would urge you to come to the meeting on the 22nd and vote. And please, if you cannot come, give somebody a proxy. Okay. Thank you and good night.